One, two, three, and the place to be is to BKMC, the MCEO, Talib Kweli. We are live at the Blue Note, but we are not in New York City. We are in gorgeous, sunny, hot and a motherfucker, Napa Valley. Shout out to everybody who's hanging out with us here in Napa Valley. This is a very special event, the Blue Note Jazz Festival. A lot of wonderful things going on. But what's most important right now is I got my family in the house. These guys I've wanted on people's parties since it started. These are my actual brothers, my actual family. I exist as an artist because of them. I cannot overstate how important this group is to my life. We don't have a lot of time because we in between sets at the Blue Note Jazz Festival. I normally give a very, very long intro, but I'm going to try to keep it as short as possible. Their wordplay, their style, their music, their attention to detail, their love for the culture, it's all unparalleled. Grammy-winning, award-winning group, Worked with everybody from Snoop Dogg to Queen Latifah to Gorillaz, David Byrne, 2 Chainz, Jungle Brothers, Common, Jay Dilla, Tribe Called Quest, Black Eyed Peas, N.E.R.D., myself. Um, their run on albums is unparalleled. Three Feet High Rising, De La Soul's Dead, Balloon My Stay Stakes is High, Artificial Intelligence, the AOI series, we're going to get into that, The Grind Date, uh, First Serve, and most recently, The Anonymous Nobody. Their debut album is a classic these guys, man, I stand on the shoulders of these guys. And these guys really brought me into the game. They were first big rap group to take me on tour and take me seriously. Ladies and gentlemen, we have Maceo and Pasta News, Plug One and Plug Three from De La Soul in the house on People's Party. Word. Show you love. Hey, hey, hey. Damn. Damn, what? These are my guys right here. Damn. These are my guys right here. Damn. Make some more noise with, make some noise with De La Soul now. Whoa. Yeah. That was great. How y'all feeling? Feeling good after that. Damn, man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sitting here in the heat with us. I nah, appreciate it's all you. Good. It's all good, man. Um, black people in Napa. We got it hot up in here. You know yeah. What I'm um, question. You hear them, right? They laugh. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> first things first, I got to start because I want to dedicate this show and this episode to plug two to David Jalakor. Mm. We just lost him recently. Make some noise for Dave. Say thank you, Dave. Thank, thank you, Dave. Dave. Yes, indeed. Yes, Word indeed. Up. Um, it, you know, his loss reverberated through the industry. Mm -hmm. um, it showed how much love and support De La Soul has from the people, how much De La means to the people. Um, and, you know, shout out to that incredible man. Um, but I want to start by saying how I first came in the game in the Lyricist Lounge era. Mm -hmm. And Maceo, you and I were talking about the Lyricist Lounge era a couple of days ago and how important it was for people to come through that. But De La, y'all were very influential and inspirational to the Lyricist Lounge era. Y'all would come and host the parties. Mm -hmm. And I actually performed at one of these events and I didn't do that well because I was feeling myself. I was so doing so well in the underground scene. I came to the event that De La Soul was hosting and I didn't do as well as I should have. And that was the first time I met them. Also around that time, I had met you at the Renaissance mm -hmm. store and I tried to give you my demo tape. <laughs> I said, yo, Pasta News from De La Soul. Here's my demo. <laughs> listen, please, please listen to my demo. Like the record, you know what I'm saying? And uh, you told me, you know what you should do? You should go around the corner to Rush Artist Management. You gave me the address mm -hmm. on Elizabeth Street. Mm -hmm. You said you should get management. That's what you should do. Mm. And I, that's exactly what I did. Wow. I went around the corner. I met Tretch that day. I met MC Search that day. Dope. Just hanging out in the Rush on Elizabeth Street. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But I feel like y'all made ring, 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 hey, hey, hey about me. <laughs> <laughs> I've always wanted to ask y'all, was that song about me? Nah. I wasn't there, so it wasn't about you. <laughs> Not at all, my brother. <laughs> Not at all. <clears throat> nah. Nah, it was, um, it was this song out by this group called Curiosity Killed the Cat. And it was called, Hey, How, it was called how You Doing? And he's talking about a girl, but the chorus was, How You Doing? Hey, How You Doing? Sorry You Can't Get Through, whatever. And we was like, yo, this is a dope song. Um, but I just remember just thinking to and telling Dave and Mace, like, we was on our way to, I guess, a show. I was like, yo, we should use this, this chorus, put it with the help is on help is on the way music the from the whatnots yeah. and make it about like demos. You know, like someone trying to give you the demos. Like so I that, said, about me. It wasn't about <laughs> you. <laughs> no, it wasn't about you. It's probably the guys in front of Tower Records, but okay, not you. Okay, okay, we're done. Yeah. Shout out to all the guys selling incense and all that in front of Tower Records. Yo, um, now, y'all from Long Island. Y'all were born in the Bronx and Brooklyn. Yep. 
but y'all represent Long Island, Strong Island, Long Island's Wild and Long Island Degrees and all yep. that. I don't think Long Island gets its props in the hip hop space. Mm. MF Doom, y'all did Rock Cocaine Flow. Mm. You know, we are MF Doom fans in the house. Rest in peace, MF Doom. You got Biz Marquee, rest in peace. You got yes, Rakim. Yes, you got sir. Busta Rhymes, yep. L-O-N-S. Talk to us about Long Island's place in hip hop. Long Island's place in hip hop is extremely cemented, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it hasn't got the respect that it should have gotten because it's pretty much known to be an affluent environment. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of a misnomer. There's parts of Long Island that's affluent, but there's other parts that are really ghetto. Yeah. You know, economically stricken, you know? And we lived around that. And there was a complete imbalance in that as well. You got people who do well, you got people who aren't doing well, and they live in close proximity. So that's even a, a fire for a lot of crime. Right. Living amongst the have and have nots, right. you know? But at the same time, you know, hip hop being brewed and developed at the very same time it was going on in the boroughs. Mm -hmm. um, here it is, it was artists that was even coming out, but not being regarded for coming from Long Island. Because mm -hmm. it was a long time people thought Rakim was from Brooklyn. Right. And he's literally from Wyandanch, Long Island, right. you know? So, you mm -hmm. know, I think it just had a lot to do with it not really being so identified with being poverty stricken yeah. is why I didn't get the respect. Right. But the talent is undeniable. Yeah. Right. The P. diversity on, is man. undeniable. Word. You know? Rock, Rock Kim, of course. Yeah. yeah. You know, y'all had pot, potholes in those lawns. Yeah, yeah, yeah without yeah. question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, us to Rock Kim to EPMD to Public Enemy to Craig Mack to Keith Murray. Yeah. I mean, the list pretty much, even LL Cool J. Yeah. People don't even know. Like, he had his stint on Long Island as well. Method you know? Man. Right. Method Man. You know Method what I'm saying? Method Man is from Long Island. So, yeah. you know, yeah. I will always attribute to uh, diversity. Mm -hmm. being, yeah. being, like, one of Long Island... Long Island rappers' key thing, the yeah. diversity. No yeah. one sound the same. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, y'all were so steeped in not just hip-hop culture at the time, but just black music, dance music, club music... And I was talking to y'all in Europe just recently about how De La had such a long run of always having a, a hot single, a hit single, for like 10 years straight almost. Almost every summer, De La had something. And you just broke down making a ring, 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 and how you pieced together records that, were, that worked, yeah. right? And so what do you think it was about where y'all were at musically and y'all collective that allowed y'all to be so knowledgeable about what was happening in the clubs, uh, being so tapped into black music that y'all were able to create these crazy uh, singles, like from from Saturday to Me, Myself, and I, to even Keeping the Faith. You know, these are these are records that people could put on right now and feel like hot dance records. Yeah, I mean, as Mace was saying, man, we were just basically we we were kids with our families who migrated from the inner cities to Long Island, and I think we had uh, this love and curiosity of music the way any kid or person would have, but the surroundings, I think, allowed us to tap in it, tap into it more than just feel like, yo, you know, like, I'm a person who's from the Bronx and I love this Steely Dan record or um, I love this record by ABBA, but my condition when I walk out in this pissy stair, you know, staircase, it doesn't feel like if I get on the mic, I should have that type of music behind me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think like with us being in Long Island and kind of having the 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 grass and the you know like when when I lived in the Bronx, my my parents always sent me to the country because I couldn't send I couldn't spend a uh, summer in the Bronx. He was a fresh air kid. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, I had to go to Waynesboro, Georgia. So when I moved to Long Island, it was that it was like you can hear these records that were you felt like. It was like from another universe. You could see these songs on MTV that felt like another universe. And you can implement them into like the creativity of it all, of it all, because you didn't feel like you were standing amongst a scenery that didn't make yeah. sense to it. You know? Yeah, I mean that's what I feel. I heard y'all on Drink Champs, uh, and if you haven't seen De La Soul's Drink Champs, check it out. Shout out to Nori and EFN. But talking about how Dave, when y'all was doing Me Myself and I, was mimicking the Jungle Brothers, Black is Black, which yeah. makes sense in retrospect. Yeah. But I never caught that that's what he was doing. In my mind as a fan at that time, I'm like, this is a native tongue style. Mm. But as an adult who makes music for a living, I'm like, oh no, okay, I see that. Yeah. But also it made me think of um, 
one of my favorite De La Soul records of all time, uh, Simply Having. Mm. Where you uh, take on the Paul McCartney joint. Yeah. And tell me if I'm correct about this, because I heard third person that Dave didn't want to be on that record either. Dave was very picky. There's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot of records he didn't want because to on that be record on. he's on the first verse he's Greg Nice. Yeah. On the second verse he's Smooth B, <laughs> which is strange as fuck. <laughs> and like, why are you just some other rapper without any explanation or context? You know what I'm saying? And he's well, really good at Smooth B and Greg Nice. Dave actually loved the record when Dave West had put it together. He thought it was a dope record. He was just kind of upset that I didn't want to do the changing of the voice oh, thing. Oh, okay. So, like, when he really nailed the whole um, Greg Nice thing, he said, yo, so Merch, you should be smooth B. I was like, yo, I, I can't do that. <laughs> like, I sound crazy doing that. Right. Like, and no, so, I wrote my own verse. Yeah. It's not like me. Yeah, so he he kind of got turned off to the song once I didn't want to do the smooth B thing. I was like, nah, I'm going to do my own rhymes. Like, you could do that. Right. And so he kept he kept it, and he, and he and he sounded amazing doing that. I was like, yo, nigga, I can't do that. I can't sound like that. Well, yeah, I don't think y'all get enough props as a collective for the production mm. and how y'all have made these classics. A lot of what Dayla Dayla works with different producers from Premiere to Jay Dilla, but a lot of the production has been in-house. Yeah. And um, for those of us who don't know about the legacy of Prince Paul mm. and Stetson Sonic and daddy -O and all these guys that you guys learned from and came up under, talk to us about how important Stetson Sonic was and Prince Paul was. Stetson Sonic to me, was uh, the first hip-hop band. Yes. Yeah. Um, and we had know, Jazz Fest, so that's and, important and, and, and to shout out, shout out to The Roots mm -hmm. for being who they are. But, yeah. Uh, Word the, the first band I've I've experienced in hip-hop was Stetson Sonic. Yeah. Um, along with two incredible, with, with three incredible MCs who I felt like was truly ahead of their time with their lyrical wordplay. Mm -hmm. Uh the production overall was, in my opinion, theatrical. You yeah. know, very theatrical. They were the groups, they were the group that would implement, uh, still add, adding like a bridge mm -hmm. to the song. Nowadays, we just got verse, chorus, verse, chorus. Mm -hmm. But they were the group that would add the bridge. Mm -hmm. And then Prince Paul would do these scratches that would be a part of the bridge that was just so divine to what we now call hip-hop. Yeah. I, I honestly think... Um, Stetsasonic, Fuquan in particular, is the one who coined our genre. That's right. Hip-hop music. It ain't nothing like, like hip-hop hip -hop music. music. You like it because you do. Yeah. yeah. Prior to that, we were just saying this rap thing. Yeah. We're doing this rap thing. We don't know where it's going, but it's, we're doing this rap thing. Right. You know, B-Boys, Breaking. It, it was all kind of just surrounded around those titles. Mm -hmm. But I I would honestly say Fuquan was the first to coin it as a genre. Right up. You know? And yes, the Sonic is very important to what we decided to do. I would honestly say the one song, My Rhyme, influenced a lot with us. Mm -hmm. with they, with, the way they would uh, implement lines from different songs mm -hmm. and putting it in their verse, uh, even taking it from the record itself. Yeah. I, I, I think we were inspired by that in a major way, you know? Since yeah. Posh would do it a lot. You know? Yeah, without <laughs> yeah. question. Right up. Without yeah. question. Right yeah. up, go Stetson. But, uh, yeah. yeah, one of the groups I definitely, the group, mm -hmm. I would say um, my production style mimics. Right up. In a major way. Yeah, it was amazing seeing them in the studio. You know, Paul bringing us there, and you see Daddy O at work, and, you know, it, it's just that, it's just those moments that just activate something in you, in you creatively, and you're like, you know, you just can't wait to get back and, formulate with your, your you know, as a as a crew, De La, together to, like, to do the same thing. So it was definitely an amazing moment for us. You know it was saying? almost like affirmation to what you were doing. Yeah. Like, yeah, I think I'm doing the right thing. Right up. Mm -hmm. And actually even seeing someone who we knew personally, like Paul, fit so well in something we wouldn't think he would really fit into, like, with those guys. So it just even made me feel like musically, you can always bring something that can come from a different lane from something else and then place it together. You know? This was crazy enough. Paul is the only member in that group from Long Island. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, right. I know Daddy was a Brooklyn guy. I was yeah. when I started my career, he was living in an apartment with uh Lance Rivera and um around the corner from me. And I would go over that apartment and I would see Daddy's 
influence over the new generation. Mm. Over what Little Kim and Lil C's and yeah. what about to do. Yeah. You know? Shout yeah, out to sure. Daddy. No sure. doubt. For sure. Yeah, man. The violator management thing. Violator management became such a huge behemoth in hip hop. It became an unstoppable force of reckoning. But it started with very humble roots. Started with baby Chris running around with Red Alert. Y'all were around for all that. Chris Lighty is someone whose name comes up on this show all the time. Matter of fact, we talk about doing a whole episode where we just have clips of people talking about Chris Lighty because that's how much his name uh, comes up. So if you don't mind sharing just what y'all your journey with baby Chris Lighty was. Well, it's crazy because um, just recently I was just, because I've just throughout my career always took a lot of pictures. Mm -hmm. So I just ran across a whole bunch of us together with him. And he was our brother, man. I mean, like, he was the very vocal, fly <laughs> dude who was ready to get jump off if it had to jump off. Like, he was ready, but he was very intelligent. And, yo, like, just those early days of us in Jungle together and um, him being the road manager out on, out on the road and doing what he's doing. Yo, we just have a lot of fun together. So it was great to even when we really locked in with with Rush from the beginning. And I know Tribe was thinking like, yo, should we do the same thing? Because it was a hard decision. You know, we were really tight with with Red Alert, you know, and, and what he was trying to provide for us in terms of trying to get shows and stuff. But even once Tribe made that decision to move towards Rush like we did, mm -hmm. and Chris went that, that way, Chris, he was very knowledgeable with things but he was willing to like learn he was he told like russell and him and leor like look man i, I want to learn i want to know what's going on and and soak it all in with this group tr tribe and, and he, he had did. a lot of discernment he picked up yeah. everything very quick very quick i mean uh, and a lot of it came from the stumbling blocks of being part of red alert productions when red was trying to be a manager at the time yeah, right. and chris prior to all the business was just proud of Part of a real thorough crew called the Violators. Think, right. His name is Baby Chris because of another member in the crew called Chris, Chris Ali. Ali. Mm -hmm. yeah. So to identify with both Chris, there was a Chris Ali and his Baby Chris. Yeah. Because obviously he was the youngest of the crew. Right. Yeah. And then his Big Rod and there was Black Jesus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, sir. And it oh, was uh, names. these was all the guys that from Red's crew. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. they held down Red. And then when we came along, they held us down. You yeah. know, yeah. there was a lot of, you know, at that time of hip hop, you could run into some problems trying to have fun. Right. And mm -hmm. then you had your eyes behind your head and they were them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Me being a fan, it was amazing for me to see the cover. I used to buy 12 inches mm -hmm. for, to see the cover of doing our own dang. Dang with a D. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know why it's dang with a D, but sure. Because um, you had all of the Jungle Brothers on there. Mm -hmm. Everybody. You had, you had Moni on there. You had Queen Latifah on there playing plastic instruments. Dave went on. Dave wasn't on there. Yeah, Dave went but on. Chris is on there. <laughs> yeah, so Chris is on there. me as a fan, I became a fan of baby Chris just because I wanted to be in the native tongues. Mm. How many of y'all watching wanted to be in the native tongues? Mm. Oh, love. Like, love. I felt like if I could just be in the native tongues, mm. my life would be complete. I felt like y'all was my tribe. I used to try to dress like y'all. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I used to tell y'all that when I when I got to know y'all, y'all mm -hmm. was like, we don't dress like that no more. <laughs> <laughs> sure didn't. <laughs> um, tell me about the start of Native Tongues and sort of take us to, you know, there was a, a time when you in particular, Merce, were addressing the fractures in the crew. Yeah. Like, you were very vocal about it. Like, I don't like what's going on. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. But then people got older, had families, and come back together. So just give us, like, the rundown of what, what Native Tongues is and what it means to you. It was, a, it was just friends. It, basically, it's like... What I personally describe it is, is like, you go to school, you meet a whole different bunch of people, you start clicking with different people. So it's like us coming into the school of hip hop, which we always want to be a part of, just through Paul, we could be hanging with MC Light. Mm -hmm. We could be hanging with Audio 2, and we just bugging out. Yo, we hanging with Audio 2, and you see how good people they are. You're hanging with Greg Nice and Smooth B. But then while you're doing all this, you meet these guys called Jungle Brothers. And then they introduce us to Q-Tip. And then it just become like, yeah, we can hang out with all these people. We can all go to um, Hotel Amazon and hang out at this club. And, and I see this guy named Guru, and he's telling me he's part of this crew called Gangstar. You're hanging around each other. But it's just that Jungle and Tribe, it was just something about 
us and them, like, we just quite honestly fell in love with each other. Like, yeah. we was around each other every day. Like, I was at Tip's crib and his mother's cooking for me. I'd be at, I'd be with Africa in his crib and his pops and them making oatmeal. Like, we just became family. They can come to my house and hang out. So we just became just family. Latifah getting signed to Tommy Boy and then Latifah coming out to Long Island, right. just hanging with me and Mace. Like, right. it's just something that just became natural. And you realize, like, yo, these are my... These are my and this hip hop thing. This our day yeah, before one. Before meeting Latifah was meeting Forty Five King. Yeah, shout out to Forty Five King. Forty Five King through Red. Yeah. You know, so and here it is. I'm hanging out with Mike G, going up to his crib, and not realize not realizing that Red Alert's his uncle. Yeah. So yeah. Why wasn't Mike G telling anybody that? We wasn't. He uh, wasn't. Right? He wasn't. I think he didn't want the nepotism. Well, well he's a humble soul, yeah. man. Yeah, he really through is. Through and through, like. Um, and I think, you know, growing up in this thing, mm -hmm. not all that special to Mike. Yeah. Right. He's really from the soil. He's yeah. really from the source. He's really yeah. from the Bronx. Yeah. So he really? Was there. Yeah. 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 He, he's a child of this. Yeah. A direct child of this. Yeah. So uh, it's nothing like second nature about. to him. Yeah. It's nothing to brag about. It's yeah. like it's like with our kids, nothing to brag about. Right. Yeah. Our kids is like, so what you're Tyler? Right. right. Yeah, so like, what you're Maceo? You know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I like Travis Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Travis Scott. Sound Word up. <laughs> Wearing all black today wasn't smart. Who is that rapping over my record? <laughs> That's my song with Asher Roo. Hey. And you word. know what he played before this, right? Mm -hmm. Don't sweat I the technique. Attention. Uh -huh. Shut up, man. <laughs> <laughs> Not even Nine. wonder. What up, bro? bro? You gotta come do this shit. I need a towel like you have on the head when you DJ. Yo, you, need to, you need to run that towel out of respect. <laughs> Damn. Where well, your trademark towel? Man. I need that. He got that five o'clock hoodie. Shout out, right. to shout, out, shout out to Knife Wonder, one of the most important producers Word in up. all of hip hop history. Right. Very important figure. Now, let me tell you something that I don't he know. wanted to be in the native tongues too. I don't know if I should say this. I would have loved it. I mean, I always say native tongue from a collective outside of friends and what the world expected is the best thing that never happened. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. minute it got started, it was over. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have to attribute a lot of it to us coming into business individually with individual business situations. I mean, everybody yeah. was in their early so, 20s at best. Yeah, right? yeah. Young, and, young and different yeah. things were happening for different people at different times. And it was all about what was, I guess, important for your, each individual's career. Yeah. Us, it was just happening, so we was open and open for a lot. Yeah. There was ideas of doing a play, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. But at that time, Africa had a movie deal. Latifah was really get ready to go into television. Mm -hmm. You know, things were really happening for them as far as TV and movies. Yeah. So those are tough decisions That's to right. make. right. He was in Living Large. Right. Yeah. Those are tough decisions to make. That's a strange thing. Yeah. When yeah. things are... Yeah. Move in a certain way, you know? And, and honestly, as well, even at that time, with us being who we were, it was really hard for the labels to kind of gel. Come together, yeah. You know, to, to gel together. So, so it was like, all right. Right. You know, labels like... feeling different Like, we should control it. So right. Tommy Boy should control it. Jive right. should control right. us. And da-da-da. Like, was... Right. This is why it took so long for us to get Spider-Man in the MCU. So anyway, you talk about... <laughs> I, I, I you, that. <laughs> you talk about labels. Um... Let's make some noise for De La Soul for successfully getting that catalog back. Oh, thank you. After all these years. Thank you. I don't think people realize that for all these years, during the streaming era, when everything switched to MP3s and we all started listening to music on our phones, De La Soul music was not available this whole time. Nah. Because Tommy Boy, they did a deal with Tommy Boy. Tommy Boy is very greedy, very unfair, and, and kept their music from them. And y'all successfully liberated all that De La Soul music. Yes, sir. Um... Yes, sir. In 2010, y'all had put out all the records for free online. Yeah. I got a lot of that stuff digitized because of that. Yeah. Um, I want to shout out Tina. Where's Tina at? What's up, Tina? <laughs> because from what I heard, Tina was instrumental in you not wanting to settle. Tell me why y'all didn't want to settle. Well, um, to surmise it for you, I'm going to be very candid, very real. It was like... Uh, Freeing the slaves, but adding vagrancy laws. <laughs> That's what it was like. It right. was it was almost giving me a house that I couldn't do nothing with. Right. You know, the word... That's the a word, great metaphor. The word play in the contracts, you mm. know. Um, 
I, I, I got a house I could live in, but I can't sell it. I can't control nothing but live inside it, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, that just wasn't going to work, you know? Mm -hmm. For me or my crew, mm -hmm. you know? Um, it was, um, like I said, another form of slavery, in my opinion, the yeah. way the words would come across in the contract. And then um, also at feeling pressured mm -hmm. and at times to do certain things, because here it is, each individual could feel different about what we want to decide, you mm -hmm. know? So, you know, my wife just played a good role in just being in my corner to know that, I, you know, I could be pressured to do different things that I don't want to do, you know, right. for the so-called bigger picture. Right. And the more we got to talking about it, I was like, we're talking about a new deal over old music mm -hmm. and the age we're at at the same time. What future opportunity are we talking about? What future opportunity are we really talking about? And then the more I assess this thing, we're in a business that we're worth more dead than alive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was about really negotiating that deal based on death than life, yeah. knowing the reality of the business that we're in. So, and it was a tough decision to make collectively, you know, but God was on our side. My wife was on my side. And it worked out for the best, you know. It wasn't even um, Tommy Boy who made it right. It was the the new owners of the catalog. Reservoir, that made it right? right? Yeah, Reservoir. Yeah. Cause Tommy Boy would have never. Tom Silverman would have never made it right. Yeah. I, I don't want to keep saying Tommy Boy because because there was people yeah. that worked for Tommy Boy that are really special people. You yeah, know, I mean, part, and made of, it happen. part of the fan experience with Daylight is reading the comic on Three Feet High and Rising and getting to know. Monica Lynch and getting to know yeah. Dante, Dante Ross, Ross and, and, and so many others becoming fans of them as executives. Yeah, you know what I'm yeah, yeah, definitely true. And, and 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 those people are been the great people along the journey of the success of De La Soul. They understood us. Right. They believed in us. They didn't allow us or would would even get in the way of uh, having us compromise, making any of the music that we chose to make. So to be clear, Dante is not a scrub. Nah. nah. <laughs> okay. That's our brother. You hear that, Dante? You were not a scrub. It's official brother. as of yeah. today. He gave, he gave me the name Baby Huey. Baby Huey. Yeah. Yeah. I get Baby Huey. When you said the one they called Baby Huey, I was yeah. like, I get it. I get it. I get that reference. Um, we need to bring Spit Kicker back. Yes, we do. For people who don't know me and yeah. De La Soul and yeah. Farrell March and Common Sense and Word. Rest in Peace Bismarck, we went on tour with High Tech. Yeah. Called the Spit Kicker Tour. Mm -hmm. um, and it was one of the greatest. I believe Spit Kicker got way more strength than Native Tongue does. I think that would be probably the catalyst to inspire some Native Tongue. But we need to make Native that Tongue would be really hard to do because we don't have Dave or Fife. Right. Yeah. In my opinion. Right. But I feel like, in the spirit of that, Spit Kicker is the thing to do, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I would love to do that again. Word. Right. You know? Yes. That's a, a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, we had a lot of fun. I met y'all through my ex manager, Corey Smith. Yeah. I learned a lot from Corey Smith. I learned a lot from y'all. Thank y'all. In that era, y'all did the Soul Rebels record with me mm. on my debut album, yes, High sir. Tech. It was very important for me to have De La Soul on my debut album. And I want to hold you to this while cameras is on you. I want the Train of Thought record. Okay. That you didn't put on the album. I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> and I was pissed. I was like, yo, this oh, record is so dope. All put people dope. on the spot are funny. I'm singing. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm borrowing from a REM, The End of the World, as we know it. Mm. That's great, it starts with an earthquake, bird snakes. That's the flow from that record. Word! Yeah. Wow. I just repurposed it. I'm like Dela. I just take mimic <laughs> flows. <laughs> wow. That's crazy. Wow. Um, That's now, y'all love touring. Mm -hmm. yeah. Being on the road is therapeutic. I've yeah. been on the road with y'all a lot. Yeah. But we're all getting older. Yeah. yeah. So how do we maintain wellness while creating new revenue streams so that we don't have to tour. You have to repurpose yourself for that. You, you know, it's, me and Mace has talked about this. We're talking about it now, like how it's a blessing to have opportunities always pop up. And you look at this calendar and you see like these shows and then you have this, these moments where you're off and you can be like, yo, I could be resting. I could be going here to just chill and get my mind right up. And then all of a sudden someone comes out of nowhere, yo, man, so I got this, I got this opportunity. And it, you know, you, it's it's hard, but you tap dance for opportunity. Yeah, <laughs> but you know you have to, at this age, really understand how you have to prioritize your health. Mm -hmm. 
you can't do none of it if you're unhealthy. You know what right. I'm saying? So it's very important, you know, to take the time mentally, physically, even spiritually to get yourself right and put that first at times, opposed to always jumping into that, what created the whole theme of that album, Grind Date. We was just always on a grind, you know? Mm -hmm. Even when we had, at those, in those moments, like something like, wow, we've obtained something amazing, but we was always off to the next grind. Yeah. It was just something we was used to doing. But and, it, and the hardest part of the grind is the travel. Yeah. So it's like, you know, having to condition yourself for the travel part. And, yeah. And, and maybe switching that up a little bit, you mm -hmm. know? Getting to town a couple of days earlier yeah. so you could decompress. Break yeah. Up. Yeah, eat the yeah. right food or something. Yeah. You know, maybe not fly this time, take a boat or a train or you something, know. you know? Don't have a road manager who always try to stuff tequila down your throat. You heard that, Smiles? <laughs> <laughs> Yo, you know what's crazy about that? Is that... <laughs> Shout out to Smiles, by the way. This morning was difficult for me. I'm yeah, sure. I'm sure it was. Because I was sure. drinking tequila with Smiles. Because I know how to tap out. We're, we're talking about our, our road manager, Smiles. Yeah. Wherever he is. I know how to tap out. That's right. another thing about getting older, just knowing when to tap out and run. Yeah. Literally Smiles run away is from yourself. the true definition of a no-limit soldier. <laughs> uh, yeah, if you can make it through Smiles, you're good. You, you can make it through this entertainment business. Yeah. Yo, my baby mom don't even come around smiles no more. <laughs> One night he was in Mexico. We, who was I with, with in Mexico? I don't know. Was it you? Was it you? Oh. And smiles was there. Uh -huh. And it, it was Mexico with tequila <laughs> oh. and smiles. Was, yeah. Yeah, man. Oh, yeah, yeah. We Remember made a pack. He don't mess with me, I don't mess with him. <laughs> mm -hmm. We good. No doubt. Because where he's at with the tequila, that's where I'm at with the weed. No doubt. Mm -hmm. No doubt. <laughs> Shout out to my smokers. Uh, um, wow. Now, for my money, Stakes is high. You know, De La has amazing albums. Before I ask about Stakes is high, I want to ask a question about De La Soul's Dead, about the title. What was the blowback and the pushback y'all got from maybe the fans and the label from trying to roll out and say, no, De La Soul is dead? I wouldn't say it was much blowback from fans. More so from the label. From the label. Not from the fans yeah. at all. Fans understood it. Yeah. 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 And it's crazy because um, I remember... Uh, yeah, it was just that they just didn't understand. Like, they was like, yo, this could be almost like suicide. Like, you're trying to put out an album and you're saying you're dead. Like, like why are y'all going to do that? And then, you know, but we did our best to explain to them, like, what it meant to us. It was just, right. you know, death is like a transition. Mm -hmm. And we felt like transitioning from the Daisy Age or the way people saw us to look, right. this fluorescent cover and flowers, we are just growing. We've outgrown that. You know what I'm saying? And that's pasta news. Broad concept when it really what, the came inner together. Sound, but the immediate oh. was walking into Rush and saw the De La schedule on the board, and Dave just wrote "dead" next to every date <laughs> that we had on. <laughs> wow! Because yeah. we were working like crazy back then. Mm -hmm. Things was happening so well, and Rush management had us working a right. lot. A whole yeah, lot. As they, that's yeah. why Merce sent me there. Yeah, huh? <laughs> he was like, oh, you, <laughs> "You think yeah. you ready?" Work. <laughs> hey man, I don't care. You know. People are people. Everybody got, you know, good and bad in them, you know? Um, I don't care what anybody say about Russell and Leo. Mm -hmm. They taught me how to fish. Yeah. A they lot of give, people they, have that story. They didn't give me a fish. Yeah. They didn't give me the fish and keep filling me up with the fish. They taught me how to fish. Mm -hmm. So when they decided to dissolve Rush Management and we decided to not go at Lighty and do what we needed to do. We knew how to fish, and we kept fishing. Yeah. You yeah. know, so I really thank them for teaching us how to fish. Yeah, right no doubt. You know, because there was no business model to this thing. They were the guys who created right. this. They did. So I, 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 tru I truly thank them for, for what a lot of people may condemn them for, mm -hmm. calling Leo a culture vulture and all of that. I don't agree with that. Mm -hmm. He's done a lot for this culture. He's done a lot for people. Um, to call, you know, here it is, we... There's some bad things been done on his behalf, but um, but nobody complains when he's doing the bad stuff for you. That's a good point. When he's doing the bad stuff for you, no one says anything. You on board. So shut up now, is right. what I say. You know what I'm saying? Right. Because when it was working for you, you didn't say nothing, you know? So I just want to shout them out and, and thank them for a lot. Word up. Because this is a hard business to be in. Word up. And you got to have tough skin, and it's all been on-the-job training. All of yeah, it. Yeah, all of it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, man. That's what's beautiful about hip hop is that we created this. Yeah. We're learning on the job. Um, now, Stakes is High was kind of a departure because I feel like Daylight was always very conscious and self aware about what Daylight represented. But 
Three Feet High Rising was like the initial statement. De La Soul's dad was like, don't put us in the box. But it was always about De La. Mm. Stakes is high. And what ballooned my state was more of like, to me, like, really, really flexing the artistic muscles. Mm -hmm. And then Stakes is high was, now we're going to address you niggas. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Now we're going to speak directly to the industry. Mm. Whereas, to me, De La had always, before Stakes is high, existed in this De, De La world. Mm -hmm. Now De La speaking on, and it's, it was different. Mm -hmm. You know, shout out to Jay Dilla, man. Like, um, that might mm. be the best sampled beat behind maybe Troy mm. of all time. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And it was a Dilla beat like no other. Because, yeah. Because um, every other Dilla beat, I think we can we can identify with even people who copy Dilla, but not that particular track. Right. I think that particular track, Dilla came with his version of Dela. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know. I think um, anytime anybody get their opportunity to work with us, they look to deliver their version of Dayla for yeah. some reason, and, yeah. and I like that. I, I I find a lot of honor and love and respect and all of that. No doubt. You know, that they truly lend something to what we've always been, mm -hmm. you know, and want to truly help take it to the next level, you know. Yeah. So I, I always appreciate. That. I I've always said um. You know, sticks is high. Just the the process of making the album, it was it was beautiful. It was so much fun. As as much as we felt it was of urgency of our career and how dire things were and things was on the line, the process of making that album, it was just totally fun. I mean, like having most Yasin around every pretty much every day. Yeah. Most was around us like every day, just such the cheerleader and like inspirational on how his energy was. And yo, know, I always say that, man. I like, relate to that. Yo, like lyrically, like him and common I'm being around, but really most, like I stepped my shit up. Like I really did. And it was just so much fun making that album. Even being able to listen back to all the tapes and cassettes I've saved and hear the early stages of each song and Yo, know, like just the, the the energy placed in that. It, we just had a mission, and like as we you know we've said so many times, that was the first album where the the title existed, and we knew what we needed to do and start putting together the correct ingredient ingredients to meet the demand of what we felt. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a great album. It's so inspirational to me. Thank you for making Stakes as High. Oh man, it's and all the albums. Thank you. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, we cannot leave this interview without talking about the legacy and the legend of David Jalakor mm. and how important he was to the culture, how important his pen game was, how important his passion was. De the locks point to De La Soul as inspiration. And I mm. point to the locks yeah. in the same regard. Because y'all never broke up. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Right? We did a lot to the death, or at least yeah. we break, break up. up. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But uh, not only that, when you see those brothers out and about, you could see the camaraderie. You see the brotherhood. Yeah. You could see the childhood friendship. It's not fake. Yeah. yeah. You could totally resonate with that. You yeah. Know? yeah. And that was definitely I, I love it every time I see yeah. them. You know, you you could tell they go through their issues, but yeah. that's brothers. Yeah. Behind closed that's, doors. Yeah, yeah. 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 And 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 the, the testament of being brothers is how you come out on the other side of those issues. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I I salute the locks all day. Wow. Yeah. Wow. All day. Wow. But this fight to get y'all catalog and the way that the catalog thing happened right around the time when Dave passed away. Mm -hmm. It makes me think of the Tropical Quest situation. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, there's been articles and movies made about issues that Tip and Fife had, but what's beautiful is that they came back together mm -hmm. and was able to get back together and make the last record. It's almost like, you know, regardless of where you are, at, where you at spiritually, yeah. there's something spiritual and something divine about the fact that this music and these relationships are so powerful, these brotherhoods are so powerful, that needed to happen before Fife left. Yes. And I feel the same thing with Dave, is that mm -hmm. this whole situation with the catalog needed to happen because it's not just business. We don't just do business. We, music is our lifeblood. Yes, sir. You know? Yes, sir. I wanted to get y'all take on that. Nah, I mean, I, I just totally agree with what you're saying. I mean, um, there was... We, we were, and we are, but even at that point, we were just a group that regardless of all the struggle we was going through with that, which was very important, this, this catalog that meant so much to our life, that's a big 
dense part of our history. We were still out there working, still making other music, still having other opportunities fall in our lap, still creating together, still having fun together, and learning and evolving. I mean, even from a business standpoint, this dude bringing Bitcoin into our lives. We learning from him about Bitcoin, like Dave invested. We all just was just moving along with life. But, you know, the grind and the grit, the standing on the front lines of just trying to get through all the issues with making sure, as Mace was saying earlier, everything was correct before this music came out. Yo, that shit took a toll on niggas. It did. It yeah. was a lot of work because you knew what you deserved. You knew, even we was very, we we cared a lot about our fans, our listeners. Like, yo, what they needed, what they wanted to hear. And man, yeah. I mean, like Dave, alongside of all of us, put in a lot of work. A lot of just times us sitting on the on the phone for damn near two hours just strategizing. What should we do? Getting other people's opinions. Man, it was a lot of work. And I, like I said, a lot of toll on our health, you know, mentally. Yeah. So I know that shit took a Still lot of having effort. a hard time with it, Kwa. Yeah. I know, brother. Still too yeah. fresh. It's, you know, me being a part of these events on all that, it's me trying to step into it. Because mm. it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard. Well, I want to let you know, Mace, that you have done so much for us. <laughs> Yeah, man. Just already that you you don't owe us anything else. Nah. It's hard. You know, you know, feel free. We love you, brother. Word up. We love you. Oh, you know, we, yeah. And we, we love, love you, that you keep it real with us and show us. Our friends, it's 15, we was 15. I met, I met that man. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, my childhood, my childhood friends. Yeah, man. My brother's gone. It's, it's mm -hmm. just, just, it's hard. It's hard. That's right. No doubt. That's no right. No doubt, it's my hard. brother. It's hard. It's hard. Yeah, man. You know what it is with us. Word. Ooh. Yeah, nigga. Oh, nigga. I, I try, I try not to cry, but it's. it's ah, certain you things let it out. It's like you know. Yo, he he earned every bit of the tear. That's our brother. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh -huh. You know. You know, it's just and like he, 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 you was with us on the road. We just was doing shows, and I just blacked out because I was like, damn. Yeah. Dave ain't here doing the ad libs to this yeah. shit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> That quickly, and then like y'all caught and saw how I was stuck. So yo, man, it's it ain't gonna never be the same because we've I've known Dave since I was in fourth grade. Like I learned, I knew him through his brother. His brother was in my grade, and that's how I got to know him. So it's like it's it's beyond daylight. It's it's like um it's a friendship. It's a brotherhood, you know. And it had its trials and tribulations, but it was it's it was still under the umbrella of love. Yeah, and that's where that's where we've always stood with it, and we want to honor and do right by him. You know what I'm saying? I mean, and his family said that. Like when we gathered after his death, like they gathered around us. It's like, yo, man, please don't stop. Mm -hmm. You know, I, you know, if you stop, he stops. Yeah, and we, um, you know, I'm pretty content with a lot, knowing what we discussed 48 hours before he passed. Yeah, what well, all the things that we got to work out. Mm -hmm. As brothers and as business partners, mm -hmm. a lot of things got really solid in the last 40 hour, 48 hours. Um, did we did we expect death? Nah. nah. We knew he wasn't well. We was even talking about the adjustments to perform on stage in a manner where he didn't really have to do much. As you can see, I've been stepping it up through the years yeah. anyway because of his condition and things mm -hmm. like that. So, But nobody thought this was permanent. You know what I mean? Yeah. We just was just making slight adjustments so we can still deliver, but but then he passed, you know? So it just yeah. changed the trajectory of everything, mm -hmm. you know? But what we were prepared to do and what we discussed, I'm just trying to do my part to carry it out like we discussed, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so is he, you know? Yeah. And the affirmation from his immediate family, they were like, we need to keep doing this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so... Well, no... Words of one of the greatest De La Soul songs of all time. Make sure the headstone reads that he did it for us. No yeah. doubt. You know, that's a very Word. important Word. Yeah. Word. No doubt. No doubt. Word. He did Word. it for Word. us. Thank you, Dave. 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 Um, Damn. Yeah, man. Now, we got to represent Dave on this uh, New York State of Mind tour. Mm. Y'all about to go on with yep. Nas yes, Wu-Tang. Yes, sir. Um, you know, I'm going to be coming on in a couple of those days yes, with y'all. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, I'm also looking forward, Mace, to the 
AOI third installment. Yes. Yes, sir. Are we getting that? We're definitely getting that. Now that we got one and two, um, it's definitely going to be a collaborative project. Yeah. I look to have you on it. I'd you know love to be saying? on it. So, you know, just um, think of the DJ when you're writing your rhymes. No doubt. <laughs> I mean, that's how MC um, started, right? We started out talking and about the I'm DJ. And I'm looking to have a lot of my DJ friends on it as well. There you go. All the ideas are brewing. Mm-hmm. They, they've been brewing for a couple of months now, so yeah. I'm just happy to be in a creative space. I think behind all this pain, somehow creativity does yeah. flourish. You know what I'm saying? So I'm utilizing yeah. it, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? And I've been in the studio a lot, just working and then recently coming out on the road, rocking with my man. Yeah. No doubt. Yeah. Now we get in more De La Soul music. De- yeah, more we De La Soul music. Yeah, yeah, we were yeah. definitely, definitely. Make some noise yeah. for that. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Without question. For sure. Yeah. 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 Without question. Well, and m- music with Prince Paul as well. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He wasn't supposed to tell no one. Yeah. <laughs> no. Ah, my bad. Don't tell yeah. nobody. Yeah. I just want to take the time to to really um, express my gratitude for De La Soul, and to talk about how blessed we are in this moment. Look how beautiful it is. Word. The Word. sun is shining on us. Yeah. Dave Spirit is here with us. Word. We yeah, are at the sure. Blue Note Hip Hop Fest. Yes, sir. You know, I used to not be able, be able to afford to go into Blue Note. Mm. And now we're here with all my guys perform. I was here last year. I see Nas walking around. I said, Nas, what's up? You going to perform? He said, nah, I didn't know it was going to be so many hip-hop people. I came to see some jazz. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and now a year later, Nas is one of the headliners. No doubt. And so just take this time to really appreciate the fact that you are outside of Napa Valley. Yeah. Where we're not usually welcome. Yeah. And you're standing in close proximity to De La Soul. Uh, you know what I'm saying? You. Thank you. One of the most legendary, forget hip hop, one of the most legendary music groups of all time. I've traveled the world with these men. I see the respect and the reverence that people give them when they're out and about. So, ladies and gentlemen, show your love, make some noise for the iconic, the legendary De La Soul. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank Appreciate you. that. Thank you. Word. And De La Soul sampled, uh, De La Soul sampled Knee Deep. You know, real quick, it's funny how on the new project, the I Know is now says featuring Otis Redden. Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> he yes, had to sir. get his props, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> they sampled uh, George Clinton, Parliament Funkadelic, mm-hmm. Knee Deep. Um, and at 2 o'clock, I believe, we'll have George Clinton here. I'm going to inter- interview George Clinton about his career. So, you know, we keeping it. All in the family. Yeah. All jazz. Mm. All black music. Mm-hmm. We love y'all for hanging out with us. Make some noise with De La Soul. Yeah. You. Yeah.